has nothing to do with the quality of the transplant. You can grow just as good a transplant in this pot as you can this prop tech tray. But in this pot, What's up, Lazy Dog fam? I hope everybody out there is having a fantastic day. It is Sunday, February 5th here in South Georgia. And on today's video, we're going to continue along with our seed starting discussion that we started on the last video. On that video, we talked about why you want to transplant, the advantages of growing transplants, which vegetables we like to transplant, which ones we like to direct seed. And then I kind of walked you through my late winter slash early spring seed starting schedule. And as promised on that last video, on this video, we're going to dig into some seed starting tips, talk about what seed starting supplies you might need if you're going to start growing your own transplants, in what cases it's worth investing in some high quality equipment, in what cases it's probably not worth investing in some high quality equipment. We're going to talk about soil, trays, light, domes, heat mat, all that good stuff. Now before we get started, let me just say, I think seed starting is one of the most valuable skills you can have as a backyard gardener. Usually you don't master it in the first or even the second year, but once you get the hang of it, it's like riding a bike pretty easy. And there's so many advantages to being able to grow your own transplants. You can grow out a healthier plant than what you find sitting outside of a local box store. You can grow the varieties that you want to grow. You don't just have to pick from whatever varieties they have sitting outside there lots of great reasons to be growing your own transplants so now let's dig in and we'll first start talking about soil so this one's pretty important you want to pick the right soil for growing your own transplants you don't want to pick a potting mix you want to pick a seed starting mix so you need something that holds moisture but that also drains well you don't want to be using a mix that stays waterlogged all the time and a good mix is going to have some peat in it it's going to have some vermiculite in it maybe some perlite in it it's going to be nice and fine you don't want anything chunky now what we prefer to use is this stuff right here so this is pro mix bx and it's pretty fine works really well for us has a lot of perlite in it it holds water well, but it also drains well. Another brand I've used in the past that I really like is the Sunshine Number no. 4 Mix. I'll use either one of those just depending on what I can get my hands on. Lately, I've been able to get the big bales of Pro Mix BX locally for about 35 bucks, and that's a pretty good deal. That usually lasts me at least a season or so. Now you wouldn't want to use something like this. So this is a mix I get from a local supplier and this is what we use for stepping up our fig trees. So we step up our fig trees from two inch pots into those nine inch tall pots that we use to ship our fig trees. This particular mix has compost, sand, like a little peat in it and pine bark. As you can see there, it's kind of chunky. You don't want to use anything chunky like this for starting seeds because the little roots on that plant will have a hard time forming a solid root ball around all this chunky stuff. You need something really fine. Now this mix works great for stepping up our fig trees. It would work great for container gardening. You probably even use this in raised beds, but I won't use it for seed starting. So lately all we've been using is the Pro Mix BX for our seed starting. You can see it in these cells right here that haven't been planted. And then on top of these cells where we planted those tomato seeds in the last video, we have the perlite here. So instead of covering our seeds with more Pro Mix BX, which you can do, nothing wrong with that, we like to cover ours with perlite. Just gives us a little more drainage, a little more aeration on top of those seeds. And on that last video, I mentioned you could use perlite or vermiculite, whatever you have for topping your seeds like we do. Now, in between that video and this video, we had somebody comment it was either on our Facebook or Instagram page and kind of highlighted the differences between using vermiculite for topping and perlite for topping like we do. Now, obviously, you can't believe everything you read on the Internet, but this person seemed like they knew what they were talking about. So what they said was that vermiculite as a topping does a really good job of holding moisture. So vermiculite works better as a topping if you're bottom watering. On the contrary, perlite tends to keep things a little drier up top, and perlite works great if you water from the top. That's what we do. So perlite works great for us. 
Now the other option as opposed to buying seed starting mix would be making your own. There's a lot of people out there that make their own seed starting mix. They've got a custom recipe they like and that's what they do. I've never made my own just because I haven't found it to be cost effective to make my own. If I can go get a big bale of Pro Mix for 35 bucks, the time it's going to take me to mix up my own mix and find a way to store it as opposed to it being in that nice convenient bag that the Pro Mix comes in, it's just not worth the time and effort to me. That $35 bale, like I said, lasts me at least a whole season. So for me, I'm better off just going buying a bag of Pro Mix. If you can't get Pro Mix that cheap where you are, you got to order it online for $100 or so. That's usually how much it costs on Amazon. Then it may be worth making your own seed starting mix, playing around with the different components. I just like to go buy a bale locally and then I'm ready to go. Now that we've covered soil, let's talk about the trays or the containers you should use to start your seeds in. Now, whereas the soil you use is extremely important, the trays you use isn't that important. You can use a lot of different things, but I will tell you the advantages to using the stuff we use. So a lot of people will start their seeds in something as simple as a Dixie cup or a plastic cup that they just rinse and reuse. You can use old pots like this that you've saved from a nursery where you've bought some plants in the past. You can use something like these little two, two and a half inch pots that we have. You can use some smaller trays like this. I think this one has 24 cells in it. And then you've also got these really heavy duty prop tech trays that we use most often. Now the big difference between this prop tech tray and this pot right here that we would reuse or maybe a Dixie cup or a plastic cup has nothing to do with the quality of the transplant. You can grow just as good a transplant in this pot as you can this prop tech tray. But in this pot you're using a lot more soil per plant than you are in this tray. So if we compare apples to apples here, planting a seed in one of these cells in this prop tech tray versus planting a seed in this pot here, we're probably gonna use five to six times the amount of seed starting mix with this pot as we would use in one cell of this prop tech tray. And one common misconception out there is that you gotta transplant with a bigger plant. These little tiny transplants that come out of these trays almost always hit the ground running just fine. You don't need a huge transplant. The one exception to that is those heirloom indeterminate tomatoes I told you about on the last video. I do like a bigger transplant for those because I like to plant them about a foot deep. But for everything else we grow, coming right out of these prop tech trays, you'll do just fine. You don't need a huge root ball when you're going into the ground. And one more advantage to this over this has to do with variable germination. So probably not every seed we plant in this tray here later is gonna germinate. But if a seed doesn't germinate, we haven't lost much seed starting mix there. And you don't wanna really reuse this seed starting mix. You wanna start you know, with fresh, sterile seed starting mix each time. If we plant a seed in here and it doesn't germinate, we've wasted a lot more seed starting mix than we have in here. Now, if you insist on planting a bigger transplant, I think the easy solution is start them in something like this and then step them up to a larger pot. That way you're not wasting a lot of seed starting mix on seeds that don't germinate. And one more final advantage to this versus this would be space. With this little 13 by 26 footprint here, I can grow 160 something plants. If I'm putting all my seeds in these pots, I can't grow near as many plants in the same amount of space that I can this guy right here. So if space is an option in your seed starting room or your greenhouse, you might consider going with a tray with smaller cells as opposed to using a lot of larger containers. Now, if you're new to seed starting, I would just say be resourceful. Use what you got, whether it be old pots, Dixie cups, whatever. Get the hang of seed starting in those containers that don't cost you anything. And then once you kind of get the hang of it, you can invest in something like this. If you've never done seed starting before, never grown your own vegetable transplants, you're probably going to struggle a little bit using this puppy on your first try. So get the hang of it in some cups or whatever you have around the house. And then once you master that, you can go to something like this that's going to save you a lot of seed starting mix and save you a lot of space. Now before we move on from trays, I guess I should talk about these bottom watering trays or water catchment trays. So these kind of sit underneath 
your seed starting tray and if you're growing indoors you got to have these because obviously you don't want water dripping on your floor here in the greenhouse we have a dirt floor no worries i don't use bottom trays just let the water drip through the seed tray onto the dirt floor now a lot of people love bottom watering talk about how great it is i'm not a big fan at all i would much rather top water my transplants there's a lot of big greenhouses in our area never seen a single one of them use bottom watering they always water from the top and grow some beautiful transplants now if you're indoors obviously you got to use these trays here but the way i would do it is still water from the top wait about five minutes for any water to drain through then I dump this out and wipe it out. You don't want to leave standing water in these because that can culture a lot of, you know, bacterial and, and fungal problems. So for me, it's top watering. But if you like bottom watering, don't let me discourage you from continuing to do it. Do whatever works for you. Now let's talk about heat mats. And this is something that you're going to have to have unless you're like my grandpa and keep your house thermostat at 80 degrees. Now I don't use a heat mat every time i'm starting seeds i only use them in the spring when it's still pretty cool outside and it can still get kind of cool here in the greenhouse in the fall when i'm starting seeds for the fall garden i don't use a heat mat because it's still plenty warm outside i don't need a heat mat but we need a heat mat this time of year especially for things like peppers which need warmer temps to germinate now heat mats are one of those things where you get what you pay for. There's a lot of different ones out there. There's some cheap ones and there's some really expensive ones. And from my experiences, the ones that cost more are worth the money. They're just built better. Now, if you're just starting out, just dabbling with seed starting, you may want to start out with a cheap one till you get the hang of it and then work your way up to a nice kind of commercial grade heat mat. So the ones I use are these SunPad Pro Mats. Now, I believe SunPad also makes one called SunPad Light. that probably works great for growing indoors or growing in your garage. But I like these commercial grade Pro ones for the greenhouse here. They just hold up a lot better from year to year. Now, if you're using a heat mat, you're also going to want a thermostat with a probe on it so you can regulate the temperature of your seed starting tray. Give you a perfect example of why this comes in handy. So yesterday, we started some tomato seeds out here in the greenhouse. It was pretty cool out here yesterday. I set this thermostat to 95 degrees, try to warm it up a good bit. Today, it's warming up a lot, and that seed starting tray, this heat mat, was getting a little warmer than I wanted it to be, so I had to dial back down this thermostat. If you don't have the thermostat, you just plug the heat mat in, it's just gonna run wide open, and it could, get that seed starting tray too hot you know if it starts getting around 90 95 degrees that's too hot for some seeds even some warm season seeds so the thermostat really helps you regulate the temperature of the mat and the subsequent temperature of your tray now one important thing to note here is that this heat mat with the thermostat is only going to give you about a 10 to 12 degree boost on your outside temperature or maybe the temperature inside your house so if you keep your house at 72 degrees you can expect the heat mat to be able to get your seed starting tray to about 82 or 85 degrees if it's say 50 degrees in this greenhouse even if i've got this thermostat set on 105 degrees this heat mat is only going to get that seed starting tray up to about 60 or 65 degrees it can only do so much so don't count on your heat mat to significantly raise the temperature like i said it's only going to raise it 10 or 12 degrees or so so in the greenhouse we you know can shut it down shut the door roll the curtains down warm it up in here and then the heat mat gives us a little temperature boost but it's not going to make a huge temperature change for your seed starting trays and then one of the questions we get pretty frequently about heat mats is when do I take them off the heat mats? Can I leave them on the heat mats throughout the whole transplant growth cycle? So let me try to clear that up a little bit. You can, once those seeds germinate, leave that tray on the heat mat until those transplants are ready to go in the ground. Just know that if you're leaving it on the heat mat, it's going to dry out a little quicker. You may have to water more frequently. But what I do in here, because I've only got so much heat mat space, once the seeds germinate and start putting on maybe their second set of leaves, I'll take that tray off the heat mat, put something else on the heat mat, 
that I'm just planting and need to germinate. So if you're limited on space, pull what's germinated off the heat mat, put something else there. But if you're not limited on space, yeah, you can leave it on there. Just make sure it doesn't get too hot and make sure you're giving it plenty of water so it doesn't dry out. So we've covered soil, we've covered trays, we've covered heat mats. Now let's talk about domes or domes as the Yankees would call them. So some seed starting trays, when you buy them, they come with this little humidity dome imagine something that looks kind of like this that sits over your seed starting tray and the purpose of these domes is to create a moist humid environment to really speed up the germination process you're not supposed to leave these domes on the tray as the transplants grow it's just to create that nice moist humid environment for really good germination now you certainly don't need a dome for good germination, but if you've got one that came with your seed starting tray, by all means use it. Just make sure to pull it off once those seeds germinate so you don't cook the plants. Well, if you don't have any domes for your seed starting trays, but you want to create that moist human environment, you can use something like this. Just a clear plastic container, set it over the top of the seed starting tray. So something I've done with these prop tech trays in the past, just get a large clear kind of like Rubbermaid container and sit it over the top of the tray. And it does seem to speed up germination a little bit. And then one more thing you can do if you don't have one of those big clear plastic tubs is you can use saran wrap. So after you plant a tray like this, wrap the whole thing in saran wrap. And that's gonna create that moist human environment again that we've been talking about. If you're doing that, you just got to be careful. Got to keep a real close eye on your tray. As soon as you see seedlings starting to pop out of the medium there, you want to take that saran wrap off because it will cook them and it's restricting kind of any airflow there. But the saran wrap trip works really good. We use it for seedless watermelons. You just got to keep a close eye on the trays. Now the last supply I'm going to talk about is one that I know nothing about. I'm zero help when it comes to recommending what type of grow lights to use because I've never used any grow lights. I've always been fortunate enough to be able to grow inside a little hobby greenhouse like this. Now when it comes to grow lights, there are lots of people out there that will say you can just go get a cheap shop light from Home Depot and make that work. There are other people that say you really need to invest in some high quality LED lights which can be kind of expensive. I don't know how to tell you which way you should go with that. You probably have to consult somebody who actually uses grow lights. Like I said, I'm no help there. I do know this. If you're growing indoors, you're going to need some grow lights. Otherwise, your plants are going to get leggy really, really quick because they're reaching for those lights in your ceiling. If you're growing in a greenhouse, you don't need grow lights. If you're growing indoors or in a garage, you're going to need some type of grow light set up and you do need something that you can easily raise as the plants grow. So besides being zero help on the grow lights, hopefully all that other information was useful to you. What kind of soil to use, the benefits of using certain types of trays, heat mats, and domes. So now that we've covered all that, let's put it into action here and let's plant some peppers sticking with our seed starting schedule that we talked about on the last video. Now, if you follow the channel for a while, you've probably seen me do this many, many times, but if you're new to the channel, you can see exactly how we start our seeds. So we've got one of these PropTech 162 trays here and we're gonna fill this full of pepper seeds today. Got some Pro Mix here. This stuff is dry straight out of the bag. Now, what some people will do is they will put this in a big tub and pre-moisten it before putting it in the trays. If you're doing this indoors, you probably want to do that because some of this will fall through the tray there as we fill it. So if you don't want to make a huge mess, you can pre-moisten it in a big tub, then pack it into the cells. For me here in the greenhouse where I've got a dirt floor, that's just an unnecessary step for me. So we're just going to try not to make too big of a mess here or try not to spill too much of it i'm just going to smooth this out and pack this stuff into each of these cells all right so we've got all the cells full there and we're just going to skim off this excess right back in our bucket we can use that on another tray later so the next thing we need to do is go ahead and moisten this seed start mix like i mentioned some people do this before they fill the trays we'll just use the watering one here and it usually takes about three or four times to get it nice and moist. This stuff can absorb a lot of water initially. So I water it, I wait 15 seconds or so, water it again, do that three or four times, and then it's usually moist enough. All 
All right, so after about three or four splashes with the watering wine, we've got this stuff sufficiently moistened. And you can kind of tell just by pressing them with your finger whether it's moist all the way through there. And that's what you want. You don't want it to be dry at the bottom and moist here at the top. You want it to be moist all the way through the cell there. If you push down on it and you still see some really kind of dry, powdery seed start mix, it means you need to add some more water. So the next thing we need to do is make some little dibbles or depressions in each of these cells here to hold our seeds. And there's a reason I like to do that. Now, what you could do, I guess, is not fill these cells up all the way and just drop your seed in there, cover them up, not worry about kind of making a dibble or depression in each cell. But I like to do this because it allows me to get my seed in the center of each cell. That means my transplant is usually going to grow up in the center of each cell and it makes it a lot easier to pull the transplants out of here so that's why i like to put a little depression here not very deep just deep enough where that seed will stay in the center of each cell so now we've got a depression made in all 162 of the cells in this tray now we need to put our labels in place for all the pepper varieties we're going to be planting today and my kind of naming convention or labeling convention for doing this is to put the vegetable name on one side so pepper on one side and then i put the variety name on the other side in this case king arthur and so I just need to stick those in place there depending on how many seeds we want to plant of each variety and with peppers i usually start with the sweeter peppers over here and put the real hot peppers over here so they kind of go from sweet a little bit hot medium hot a lot hot all right, so we've got all our labels in place and each one of these rows here has nine cells in it. So that kind of tells me how many plants or how many seeds I'm going to need of each variety here. I won't use near this many peppers, but we do give some plants away and I just like to go ahead and grow out a whole tray of them. Usually most pepper seed packets have at minimum 25 seeds in them. So I just grow out a bunch that way, make sure I've got plenty of plants and we've got some to give away. So let's start off right here with our bell pepper, this King Arthur variety. And as far as how many seeds to put in each cell, <clears throat> that will depend on how fresh your seeds are or how confident you are in your seed uh, supplier. So if I'm dealing with new seeds that I just bought, I'm confident they're going to germinate well, I just put one seed per cell. If I'm dealing with some two or three year old seeds I've had for a while, I might double plant each cell. So it just depends on how confident you are in some good germination on your seeds. It's really easy to thin these plants out if you do double plant them. So don't worry about that. If you accidentally drop two in there, I usually don't worry about fishing them out. But for these new seeds we just bought, we're gonna go one seed per cell. So we got our bell peppers planted. Now we're gonna go with this hybrid Serrano variety here. We'll just work our way down until we get them all planted. All right, so we got at least one pepper seed in all 162 of those cells there. Now, one important thing to note, especially when you plant these real hot peppers, like this chocolate habanero or just chocolate ghost pepper, especially for you guys out there, make sure you wash your hands before you go take a tinkle. Otherwise, you're going to have a fire in your britches. And then the last thing here is just to cover these seeds with perlite. You could use more seed starting mix to cover the seeds. We've seen some advantages to using the perlite in our case, so that's what we like to use. As I told you before, someone did comment on our Instagram or Facebook page and say vermiculite works really well if you like the bottom water, so you may want to consider that. So we want to add enough perlite to fill the cells and cover the seeds, but we don't want to add so much that we can't see the divisions between the cells there in case we did double plant any of these cells and need to thin them out a little bit. So we want to add enough but not too much and that's it all we do now water this in water it every day and let this heat mat keep it nice and warm and just wait on these peppers to germinate some of these like these really hot peppers probably going to take two or three weeks some of these bell peppers here they might start popping in about five or six days so we got our heirloom indeterminate tomatoes planted on that last video. We got our pepper started today. And the next thing on the list in about a week and a half, two weeks, will be our hybrid determinate tomatoes. And then we'll just continue along with that tentative schedule that I told you about. 
So I hope you enjoyed the video today. And if you have anything valuable to add to our seed starting tips, please do that in the comments below. Maybe you do make your own seed starting mix and want to share your recipe. If you've got some good insight on what type of grow lights to use, please do share that. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that need that kind of information. And as always, you can find links to our affiliate partners in the description below. We've got some coupon codes for some of those companies so you can take advantage of those discounts. Don't forget to go check out our website, lazydogfarm.com, where we do have a few seeds available there. We've got our fig trees for sale, garden blog, recipes, all kind of good stuff over there. If you did enjoy the video, be sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like, and share. And we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Old farewell mm -hmm. By the beauty of your life